Uh, welcome uh, to Boston. Uh, so I'm going to speak to you today following um, the nice presentation by Dr. Zagar. I'm going to speak about different technologies uh, and methods that can be used um, in these deep inspiration breath hold, breath hold radiotherapy. I have no disclosures. Uh, and just to build on the previous talk, we understand that it's very important of course, to reduce uh, the dose to the heart in uh, breast radiotherapy. And one of the nice ways that we can do that is uh, through breath hold. Um, I hope I can make the argument to you that image guidance of one form or another is necessary uh, in order to make sure that we deliver this uh, uh, radiation in a very precise and accurate manner and that the breath hold uh, is reproducible. And by image guidance, I'm going to refer to that uh, in two different ways. One is just the initial setup of the patient prior to the breath hold and then actually at the time of breath hold. Uh, here just showing you again um, what you saw in the first talk about how the heart can move out of the field under breath hold. And we have some anecdotal data that suggests that without any form of Im image guidance, just ask, setting up the patient like you normally would with tattoos and lasers, and then asking them to take a breath, we saw significant variations in the breast surface, um, greater than uh, one centimeter. So I think we can do better than this, and I'm just gonna talk to you about different methods about how we might be able to do better. This is just a rundown of different technologies that are available. Uh, we have the single uh, surface marker, uh, the RPM system. We have surface guided radiation therapy, uh, including um, the Aligner T product. Uh, active breathing control. Uh, we can use mega voltage port films uh, to make sure that the patient is taking a reproducible breath. Cone beam CT and then also uh, external transponders. So I'm, you're probably uh, quite familiar with uh, the single marker block or the RPM system. Uh, here, of course, I'm showing uh, this system in use uh, in a CT simulator. And that is one of the major ways that we use uh, this technology in terms of uh, tracking the patient's surface while they're breathing during a CT scan in order to uh, generate a 4D CT image. Um, we can, of course, also use this uh, for gating and triggering the beam and um, for for the application of breast, I would refer to this as a relative type of positioning. In other words, you can visualize when the patient is taking their breath, but it doesn't guide the setup of the patient within the room. So some other form of imaging, uh, which we do have available, of course, but some other form of imaging um, would be necessary to increase the precision of that rate, uh, therapy. Uh, there was a, a nice paper that just came out this year um, that looked at putting this marker block at different positions uh, on the patient's surface, uh, specifically for uh, breath hold uh, treatments, and they came up with the um, conclusion that uh, on the sternum, of course, was, uh, was better. We're treating the breast. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then they looked at the residual uncertainties in the breast surface and saw that it varied uh, on the order of two to four millimeters. So th that's one method using a single marker block on the patient's surface. Surface. Uh, and then we can use the, the surface, the full surface, or uh, what we would get from the Aligner T product or other products uh, like the Sentinel product. I've just listed a couple of publications here from our group and also from the North Carolina group. Um, and I just talked to you briefly about our technique um, in terms of using uh, Aligner T. So uh, what we do is we have two reference images. We have the initial uh, setup image under normal breathing conditions, and then the reference image for the breath hold. So first the patient is put in a position to take an accurate, to take a breath, and then we monitor the patient to make sure that they then take uh, a breath. Of course, there's no radiation dose here. Whoops. You can see, sorry about that. You can see the, uh, the image here and the dark purple area is the region of interest that we're registering. Here is the patient's uh, surface under normal respiration. They're asked to take a breath. The patient uh, surface moves, obviously. We can look at uh, the residual displacements and then decide either manually or automatically to turn the beam on. We generate our reference images on the first day of treatment, uh, but you can also send over information from the CT um, and create a surface, a reference service in that way. And then what we do, um, and probably other places do as well, is we still take port films on a weekly basis and use these as the gold standard for the final uh, treatment position. And if we have to update uh, the aligner T information during the course of the treatment, then we'll do so. And then just briefly, we published a, a study from 20 patients, uh, a couple thousand images, and looked at the residual um, errors or the residual real-time deltas of the breast surface position during breath hold and saw that that was on the order of two millimeters. Um, 
And we did see about 20% of the breaths that the patient was asked to take were out of our tolerance, which was five millimeters. I do think now, uh, anecdotally, if we would repeat that, we would do much better. Um, because I think just our, our application of this method has improved. Uh, this did vary from patient to patient. Um, there was a correlation with breast volume, so larger uh, patients uh, maybe weren't, uh, weren't able to um, put the surface in, in, within the window, um, but there was no correlation with age, and I think we treated patients up to about 79 years old who were able to do this um, without any issue. Uh, so then moving on to uh, more to imaging models, it allows us to sort of look inside the patient. Um, so there's some nice publications using comb beam CT, um, and uh, I've listed them here at the bottom. And what they typically do is they do the initial setup under breath hold using comb beam, and then for subsequent breaths for the treatment field, they would use another imaging like KV uh, or perhaps MV uh, imaging to check the position of each breath. Um, and they also looked at what would the setup variability be without doing this initial uh, imaging and saw that there, it was necessary to do this first um, image guidance step. But then they also cross-checked it with Align RT and saw that the surface um, agreed with the comb beam CT reference to within about uh, two millimeters. And here's just a screen, uh, a figure from one of the papers. And I believe they used a single camera at the foot of the couch. Um, that's why there's some information here missing. So it's important to ensure that the breast surface is reproducible, but of course we're doing all of this to shield the heart, so we want to make sure that the heart position doesn't vary very much. Um, and based on the data that, that Dr. Zagar already mentioned, um, they are seeing fairly good, um, a very good reproducibility of the heart position. Um, also from the comb beam data, um, they presented data that indicate that uh, clinics may want to consider adding a safety margin to the heart during planning on the order of one to seven millimeters, depending on the direction. Um, we always, you know, often do this for the targets, but don't always think about it for organs at risk, and maybe that's a consideration um, given the variability that they see in the cone beam. And then there was this uh, study um, published in 2011 that looked at 2D images and looked at the variation of the heart in the 2D projections and saw about one to two millimeters variation. So I think it's important to um, have these considerations in mind when you're designing your treatment plans. Okay, so that's um, surface imaging from a single marker to the whole surface to comb beam. And now we have uh, active breathing control from spirometry where um, we're fixing the lung volume. Um, and uh, a lot of publications on this. This is, I think, one of the first papers on using breath hold for breast um, in 2003. Um, I would, again, make the argument that some other form of imaging is likely necessary because we're controlling the position of the breath, but we're not positioning the patient. Um, and so it's very, of course, easy to do that using other imaging techniques. Um, and there's been some complications that look at the reproducibility of both the target um, and the, uh, the LED part of the heart and showing some of the variations. Again, important considerations to make. Uh, to have in mind during planning. Uh, there was a, a, a nice paper also that looked at if we fix the lung volume with spirometry, what are the residual um, uncertainties in the breast surface? Um, and I can't speak to the, to the exact um, techniques that they use, but they did look at, and I don't know if you can appreciate these numbers, but these circles represent variations on the breast surface with constant tidal volume, and they uh, run from a few millimeters up to four or five millimeters. And so it suggests that even if the lung volume is constant, there still can, can be some residual motion, um, and there can be motion of the surface uh, as well, and that's what these bottom plots are showing. So we can also uh, use uh, megavoltage imaging, and there's nice um, papers out there on using cine EPID, where you can use a movie loop, and in one case they take the average image, and then have an offline setup protocol. So they're not using it real time, but then they're using this information and modifying the setup um, uh, for subsequent days. And they actually looked at the variations for free breathing and for breath hold patients, and saw that the variations were about the same suggesting that the precision of breath hold treatments um, were roughly uh, similar to conventional uh, free breathing treatments. There was a, a, another nice paper um, from colleagues across town, the Brigham and Women's, where they used cine EPID to compare two very simple non-commercial methods um, for positioning the patient, and they actually showed using megavoltage that the variation of the lung chest wall interface was quite small. Um, they also proposed that using more sophisticated um, processing that you might be able to use this online. However, if we're doing field and field, of course you can't see the entire breast when you have the small uh, subfield, so this is uh, a consideration. 
And then uh, the last technique that I'll mention is um, the Calypso system or external uh, RF markers. Um, these are placed, as I understand it, every day on the patient, so there might be some variation of how they're placed on the patient's surface. Um, and again, you can look at the relative motion, but perhaps need some other um, technology to position the patient um, relative to isocenter. Um, but it's a nice application uh, of this technology. And so this is just sort of a summary slide comparing the different methods. Um, if they give extra radiation dose, um, if they look at the internal or external anatomy, um, if it's invasive, um, which may be a matter of opinion, um, and then if it can provide information both for initial setup uh, and for monitoring. So I'd just like to conclude by acknowledging um, the, the team in the clinic, the therapists, uh, colleagues in physics and physicians, and thank you for your time. We currently uh, use the same time slot that we would uh, for uh, a non-breath uh, hold uh, breast patient. Is that your experience as well? Yeah. Yes, a little bit of a learning curve, um, but the, the, at least for the uh, aligner T system, it's quite seamless and doesn't really add time. What if you find a discrepancy between the two? What if the uh, initial uh, setup, uh, free breathing setup looks good, and then the, the uh, inspiration doesn't, or, or you know, once you correct for that, then the, then the original free breathing no longer looks good? How, how do you deal with that discrepancy? So on subsequent days, after day one, so day one there is no discrepancy because we're generating our images, but it, it is an important point. On subsequent days, um, if, if one looks good and the other doesn't, then we go with the port film, and then we update the references. So if the breath hold looks good, um, then we may choose to update the, uh, the initial setup uh, surface image or vice versa, or we can update them both, just recapture it. But we are ultimately following, since we're used to that, following the port film information. You mentioned um, looking at uh, heart dosing. Um, have you looked at, done a comparative analysis against using standard CT versus a 4D CT? and actually looking at that heart position at any given time in space, and then looking at what the heart dose is, comparatively speaking. Uh, we have not done, done that study, no. I think there might be some publications out there from the ABC, from the um, spirometry world, um, but I'm, I'm not positive. There are comparisons out there, free breathing and breath hold, and looking at the gains in the heart, or the reductions in the heart dose, um, but I'm not sure if they've looked at different positions. I think the idea is to have the patient be able to take a comfortable breath, and be able to do that on a reproducible basis. Thank you very much.